Hallelujah. I know that I know that I know that I've got one of those messages from the throne room of God. And I want to share it with you this morning. The Lord be my helper and my God. I want you to turn in your Bibles with me today to the book of Exodus chapter 15. The book of Exodus chapter 15. And today I want us to look at verses 22 through 26. 22 through 26. And I want you to pay careful attention to this text today. God's got a word for you. He's got a word for this church. He's got a word for every visitor, every guest that's with us today. He's got a word for all, all those who may be, or may after a while view this on, by way of the internet. In Exodus chapter 15, verse 22, the Bible said, So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days into the wilderness, and they found no water. They go from dancing on the shores of the Red Sea, from shouting and praising God for a mighty victory. Three days later, three days later, they they have no water. And the Bible said, verse twenty-three, and when they came to Merah, they could not drink the waters of Merah, for they were bitter. Therefore the name of it was called Merah. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried unto the Lord. Moses cried unto the Lord. And the Lord showed him a tree. Say that with me. And the Lord. Amen. Praise God. Which when he had cast into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made for them a statute and an ordinance. And there he proved them, and said, If thou wilt diligently hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and will do that which is right in his sight, and will give ear to his commandments, and keep all of his statutes, I will put none of these diseases upon you, which I brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord that healeth thee. This whole passage ties together. The healing of the water by way of casting in a tree. And the message that God sent to Israel saying, If you'll follow me, if you'll obey my word, I'll put none of these diseases upon you, and I'm the Lord that healeth thee. Glory to God. He will heal you body, soul, and spirit. Amen. I want to preach on the thought today, the Lord, and I feel the Holy Ghost. The Lord showed him a tree. Thank God, thank God for the tree that heals the bitter waters. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, as we come to you in prayer right now, Lord, it's such an honor to come and to stand in your mighty presence and to feel you in this house and to know that you have come, Lord, to minister to your people and to help those that have gathered here today in your name. Hallelujah. Lord, let your power be proven. Let your power be manifest. Let every person that's gathered in your name be ministered to in a mighty way. Father, I pray over this entire congregation, over every young person, over every, uh, every person in attendance today, over every man, every woman, every child. Lord, let your anointing flow heavily. God, let your touch, uh, Lord, be felt in every person. Let every life be changed. Uh, God, in some way for the better, we'll give you praise for all that you do. And everybody said, Amen. As I mentioned just a moment ago, as I was reading the Scripture, uh, the Scripture makes it known unto us that what was happening in this passage, and that is uh, that Moses has led the children of Israel. He has led them out of Egyptian bondage. They came to the Red Sea, and, they, and the mountains surround them on the sides. The enemy closed in behind. God parted the sea. And the Bible said that the waters congealed. Uh, they, 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 something happened to the waters. They congealed. It was, I, when I think of the word congealed, I don't know about you, I think of jello. But whatever, I don't know if he turned them into something like concrete. It had to be something powerful because God parted the waters. And the waters became a wall on each side. 
And the waters became like a dam that held back the flow of the river. And Israel crossed on dry ground. And then God did something else so astonishing. And that is that He took those same waters. They uncongealed. And, they, and they, when God turned the waters loose, He drowned the enemy. He drowned the Egyptians. He drowned Pharaoh's army that was closed in behind the Israelites. And so they danced and they shouted on the other side of, of the Red Sea because God had done a tremendous thing. I mean, who who else can part the water? How can you explain how the water parts and it, and it just banks up on each side like a concrete wall and, and then the ground dries up and, and three million people are, 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 are approximately three million people are allowed to cross on dry ground. How do you explain that? I hear, I'm here to tell you. I know how to explain it. God, His mighty hand moved in their circumstances, but now they're three days beyond that river. Red Sea. They're three days into the journey, and the Bible said they, they three days. They, now they have no water, and and, uh, and they're beginning to complain. They're beginning to murmur against Moses. Uh, they're beginning to think, well, maybe we made a mistake by leaving Egypt. I'm going to tell you that's exactly how the devil tries to work in our lives today. God is a God who blesses us with a mighty move of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes He does miracles in our midst. Sometimes uh, He heals the sick. Sometimes the church uh, shouts and rejoices. Sometimes uh, we as individuals, we have an uh, opportunity to shout and to rejoice in the glory of God uh, and then boom, the devil hits uh, and we begin to doubt everything that's happened in the past. Come on, somebody shout amen. amen. Now they reach uh, Mara. Uh, and when they reach Mara, the Bible said that, that they, they found water. Praise God, they found water. But there's a problem. When they go to drink from that water, the Bible said it's bitter water. I, I, I just, I, I've been out west preaching before. I went out to preach, and, and the waters were bitter. I'm telling you, you couldn't drink the water. You, and, and if you took a bath in the water, you felt like you had something slick all over you when you got through because there was, it was out in volcanic areas, and they were sulfur in the water. And it was terrible. I don't care if you went to a hotel or wherever you went, that's the way the water was. And it was terrible. And I could kind of, maybe, maybe that's something like what they were going through. But the waters were bitter. They could not drink it. Maybe they even realized that not only do, are these waters stagnant or they're bitter, but if we drink them, it could make us terribly sick. They needed something to happen and they needed to happen again. And I've come to tell you that, that, that while they're on the journey, three days into the wilderness, uh, they come upon this uh, the Mara. They come upon bitter water. And we don't know that if the place had already been given that name or if uh, the, the way the Scripture reads, it seems to suggest to us uh, that the Israelites themselves began to call that place uh, Mara because the word Mara means bitter. And what they're saying is, is we've come to a bitter place in our journey. And what it describes to us is that there are things in our, in our pilgrimage, there are things in our spiritual walk, there are things in this Christian life uh, sometimes that cause bitterness in our life. Uh, there are bitter experiences that come our way. Uh, and I, and when, they, when, they, when we come come to those times in our life, uh, we need a move of God. We need a move of the Holy Ghost. How many know what I'm talking about today? Can you look back right now and think about some times of some bitter places that you came to? I mean, some places that it wasn't pleasant, some places where you could not I, have, I, it's, uh, you know, it's kind of like when you're sick and you're trying to recover, everybody around you, they seem to be perky, they seem to be uh, uh, upbeat, they seem to be uh, enjoying life, and you're thinking, if I can just get rid of this pain, if I can just get rid of this problem, so that I can smile again. Uh, you know, I, I, there have been times, uh, and this probably, maybe, I don't know if I ought to use this for an example or not, but have you ever had a, a canker sore, a sore or something in your mouth? And everybody wants you to go out and eat with them during that time. And they're talking about, man, that steak is good. And you think, I just wish I could enjoy it. My mouth is so sore. I just, I, I, it just hurts so bad to chew. And then all of a sudden, one morning, you wake up, and that canker sore, that whatever it is, is gone. And you think, glory, hallelujah. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to eat me a steak today. Amen. There are bitter places in our life. There are things that happen in our spiritual life. 
There are things that happen in our physical life sometimes. Uh, and, and what the enemy is up to, he's trying to bring unbelief into our lives. And, and the more the children of Israel begin to complain, and the more they begin to murmur, the greater the unbelief that came in their life. Are you hearing me? The devil wants you to get bitter. The devil wants you to find a bitter place. The devil wants you to begin to murmur and complain against the power of God and the righteousness of God and the sovereignty of God. But I've come to declare to you, God is God. It doesn't matter what the devil says. It doesn't matter what the pain is telling you. It doesn't matter what the circumstances are suggesting. God is God. I feel like jumping and staying right now. I said the Lord is still God and he's able to handle it. Hallelujah. Come on, give him the biggest hand clap of praise that you can. <laughs> Hallelujah. And Moses began to cry out to God, what do you do when you're a leader and people are saying, hey, we, we're starving to death, we're thirsting to death here. What are you going to do? And the only thing we have is bitter water. And probably somebody came up and said, I, surely the Lord could have done better than this. I mean, they forget about he parted the Red Sea. He, they forget about they crossed on dry ground. They have forgotten about the fact that the Red Sea that let them over killed their enemy. Now they're saying the water's bitter. We're thirsty. What are we going to do? And after three days, I imagine the need for water was great. And Moses cried out unto the Lord. And the Bible said, and the Lord showed him a tree. There are some different trees in the Bible I want to try to preach on this morning. And one of those, I want to go back to the Garden of Eden for just a moment because that tree that God showed Moses is symbolic of a tree that changed my life and changed your life. I want that to soak in for a moment. Well, what on earth are you talking about, Pastor? Uh, Jesus was nailed to a tree. Amen. And the, and the day that God showed Moses a tree in the wilderness, a tree that could be cast into the waters into the bitter waters, into the bitter place in their life and change their circumstances. God was revealing something so significant. You see, there are trees that are mentioned all throughout Scripture. There are many other things that are mentioned all throughout Scripture. And when you begin to put it all together, everything has a purpose and a meaning. And these trees, one of them is in the Garden of Eden. Look back with me at Genesis chapter 2. Verses 8 and 9, the Bible said, And the Lord God planted a garden eastward in Eden, and He put, he put the man whom he had, plant, who had, who he had formed, and out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that, that is pleasant to the sight and to the sound for, for food and good for food, and the tree of life, and the tree of life in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now here's what I want you to understand. <clears throat> Before God created man, he said, I want a special place. And God created a garden. I believe that garden, the garden, garden of Eden was already created by God before he created man. And then he created Adam and he said, I've already put, I've made a special place for you. And I'm going to put you in that special place. And this is going to be a place where you and I are going to have a, meet, a daily meeting. Praise God. How many know we need a daily meeting with God? We need to have a spiritual encounter every day of our lives. And I've come to declare to you, don't go a single day without having one. Because that spiritual encounter that you have will keep you on the straight and narrow. It'll encourage you. It'll strengthen you. It'll, it'll, it'll help you when the devil is fighting tooth and toenail. Come on. Amen. And, and, and so God created the garden. He put Adam in the midst of the garden. And, and, but but. Then God tells Adam, he said, he said, I fill this garden up with beautiful trees. There were a lot of ordinary trees in that garden. I mean, there were oak trees and pine trees and, and famosa trees and, and, and uh, weeping willow trees, probably, uh, probably all kind of trees. Ordinary trees that we would call ordinary today. But God points out things to Adam, two things. He said, but right here in the midst of the garden, there's a tree unlike all the other trees. In the midst of the garden, I have put the tree of life. And if you'll eat off of this tree, every time that body of clay that I've given you begins to ache, every time that body of clay that I've given you feels like something is trying to overtake it, if you'll come to that tree of life and eat of that tree, you shall never die. You can eat of that tree and live eternally. Somebody shout yes. 
And then, but then God, that, that's a tree that brings life. That's a tree that restores health. That's a tree that gives blessing to the, to the one who takes the fruit off of it. Evidently had fruit growing on it because in Genesis chapter 3, verse 22, the Bible said, And the Lord God said, Behold, the man is become as one of us to know good and evil. And now lest he put forth his hand and take also the tree of life and eat and live forever. So, so there's the tree of life. It's got fruit growing on it. That fruit could, be, could have been ate, uh, ate, and man could have lived and survived. But there's also that second tree. That second tree is of the knowledge of good and evil. That's the tree of death. The Bible said the wages of sin is death. God, uh, in the New Testament, it says that. The Bible also declares unto us that, that uh, not only are the wages of sin is death, but God told Adam. He said, if you eat of that tree, you're going to die. So in the Garden of Eden, there's a tree that you can eat off of and live. There's a tree you can eat off of and die. Come on, can I get a witness? Amen. Now listen to this. You've got a tree that you can eat the fruit off of and live. You've got a tree you can eat the fruit of it and die. What is the Lord saying? He said, I put, your cho I put two choices in the garden. I put two paths in the garden. If there's a path that leads to life everlasting, there's a path that leads to death and destruction, and now it's up to you. You can go to that tree or you can go to that tree. I'm so glad that God said in the Garden of Eden, I will put a tree that you can eat on and live. That old body of clay is going to need some help. It's going to need some strengthening along the way, and I've given you the tree of life. Praise God. Aren't you glad that there's something that God has provided that renews the energies of this body? Amen. Praise I'm glad that there's a God who heals. I've needed healing many times in my life. And God has always shown up. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. So thank God for the tree of life. That tree of life was lost in the fall. When Adam and Eve decided they were going to eat off that other tree, the tree that led to death. And then the next thing you know, the Bible said that they were thrown out of the Garden of, garden of Eden and that God, that God put cherubim at the entrance of that garden. And He said, I want you to guard this place uh, lest that Adam and Eve come back into the garden and eat off the tree of life and live forever. You see, what God was saying is, I don't want them to live forever in a sinful condition. I want them, if anybody's going to have eternal life, they need to be right. Uh, they need to be saved uh, because, uh, because to live eternal Eternally and, and, and eternal punishment is not is no fun for anybody, amen. And then we come back to the tree at the waters of Marah for a moment. Look at Exodus chapter 15. Go back with me to Exodus chapter 15, verses 22 through 23. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur and went three days into the wilderness and found no water. And when they came to Merah, they could not drink of the waters of Merah, for they were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Merah. The word Merah, again, means bitterness. And you know what? There are a lot of things in life that produce bitter places. It may be, it may be some verbal abuse that you've had to encounter. It may be sexual abuse that you've encountered along the way. It may be physical abuse. It may be uh, the, de the loss of loved ones. There's a lot of things that can create bitter places in our life. Uh, but thank God there's a tree. Thank God there's a tree that's been provided by God that can be thrown into the midst of your situation, that can be thrown right into the middle of your bitter situation, and it will be turned to sweet. No wonder the Word of God declares uh, that God will take that that the devil meant for evil, and we will turn out to our good. God has a way of showing up the devil. He has a way of embarrassing the minions of hell because he takes the very thing that was meant to harm us and destroy us and he gives us a reason to shout and a reason to celebrate and if somebody don't help me, I'm going to shout anyhow. Come on, somebody give him a hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. So the people murmured three days, three days into the journey. I'm telling you, I've seen new converts so excited at conversion. But very early in their journey, the enemy creates a bitter place for them. Why? Because he's wanting to pull them out. I, you know, he wants you discouraged. He wants you discouraged so that you don't keep reading the Word. He wants you discouraged so that you 
oh, I'm just not going to go out to church. I tr- I've done got, you know, I went to that altar and things got better, and I felt really great that when I went to the altar, but now look where I'm at. Look, now look what I'm going through. I'm here to tell you, God rewards those who press through the storm. God rewards those who endure the hardships. God endures the, uh, blesses those who make, make up their mind. When the going gets tough, I'm not walking away. I'm committed to God. I'm going to follow through. Amen. I may, be, I may be in the middle of a bitter experience in my life, but God is going to return the joy. Weeping may endure for the night, but joy cometh in the morning, and I'm going to hold on until the joy comes back into my soul. Hallelujah. Praise God. Give Him a hand clap of praise. That's all right. So Israel, they're three days into their journey, and, and, and what has happened? They, they have put their faith in the wrong thing. They have put their faith in Moses in place of in God. And that's why they begin to murmur and to complain against Moses, because they think Moses is the one capable of solving all their problems. It, honey, it wasn't Moses that divided the Red Sea. And it wasn't Moses who drowned the enemy. It was God. It wasn't, it wasn't Moses who made, who, uh, who made all those different plagues appear in, back in Egypt. It was God. God was working through Moses. God was working with Moses. But make no mistake about it. There is no man that can lay hands on you and solve your problems. Uh, but there is a God who can flow through man. And if, if you get blessed by anybody, it's because the hand of God was upon them and flowing through them. Amen. And the bitter waters. They represent to us the condition of this present world. There's, there's some bitter things going on in our world today. There's, some, there's, some, uh, there's a lot of unstableness. There's a lot of things that are going on. And some are suffering, uh, suffering at the hands of others. Some are, are, are suffering different things. And in Exodus, we go back to Exodus 15, verse 25. And Moses cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, which when he had cast into the waters... The waters were made sweet. There he made for them a statute and an ordinance, and there he proved them. So what the Scripture is suggesting to us, they are telling us there, Moses didn't just decide to cut a tree down, throw it in the water of his own accord. How did he know to throw that tree in the, in the water? First of all, God showed him the tree. Moses, this is a tree like no other. I put that tree there because I knew you'd be coming to this place. Amen. Long before the Israelites got to that place, long before they got to Marah, God had already provided a tree. Long before Isaac and Jacob, or Isaac and Abraham, made the journey up, up on the mountain, the Mount of Sacrifice, God had already provided a ram for the sacrifice. And the, and the Lord spoke to Abraham and said, Hey, I will provide for myself a lamb. That ram was not the lamb, but that ram filled in for Isaac. But there would be a day when the lamb of God, when the lamb of God, when the son of God would come to earth and die in our place. Somebody shout amen. Hallelujah. God showed him a tree. And cast that tree into the... If you, if you don't drink water, I mean, it's... It's, it, you know, here's the thing they tell us. In about three days of not drinking water, your kidneys begin to shut down. They've got three million people, around three million people, plus all their livestock, all these animals that need water as well. And what are you going to do when the water's bitter? God had already provided a tree. Cast that tree in that water, and that, that water that's been bitter will turn sweet. And you can drink of that water and live. Somebody shout glory to God. When you look at that tree of life, it became a tree of life when it was cast into the waters because they were able to drink that life-giving water. That goes all the way back to the Passover lamb. When, when the, when, back in Egypt, when Israel selected a lamb, a lamb for every household, and they took the blood of the lamb and applied it to the doorpost, and the blood of the lamb was, became a thing of protection. When the death angel came through town, he, he skipped every house that had the blood applied to the doorpost, and that's kind of what the tree of life was all about. Amen. Praise God. The Red Sea betrays the believer being baptized into Christ. Now, this is not a water baptism. This is a spiritual baptism. We're buried with Christ spiritually. We're resurrected in the spiritual sense. Jesus died in our place. 
He took our place on Calvary. He literally died and He rose on the third day. And when we look to Him in faith, then we become buried with Christ and resurrected with Him. And we realize that I'm a new creature not because of my works, not because of what I've done, but because of what Jesus did at Calvary. I am set free. Hallelujah. Look at Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 5. Know you not that as many... As many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore, we're buried with him by baptism unto death. Not baptism in water, baptism unto death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we, sh- we also should walk in the newness of life. And for if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we will also be in the likeness of His resurrection. Praise God. We've been planted with Him at the altar in the likeness of death. But when we, when we got up from that altar, we were resurrected with Him in the newness of life. I'm, t- I'm telling you, God has done a tremendous work in our lives. And because He lives, Jesus said, because I live, you shall live also. Amen. Praise God. Let me tell you something very important while I'm here. Salvation is in Christ alone. It's not Jesus plus something else. Here's what happens. In fact, the the Bible tells us that we're not saved by our works lest any man should boast. Amen? What happens when when we feel like our works have saved us, you know what happens? We get very prideful. We become very prideful people. And we begin to look down on anybody that doesn't practice the works that we practice. Amen? When you become, the Bible said that pride comes before fall. Amen? You can't be saved by Jesus plus something else. But we're saved by putting our faith in Jesus and Him alone. Amen? There are not many ways to heaven. There's only one way. And it's not Jesus plus let me do some good works. It's, it's Jesus and, and, and faith in what He's done at Calvary alone. Amen? There's also a tree. There's a tree and a serpent of brass. I'm going to try to move quickly with this. But you look at Numbers chapter 21 and verses 8 and 9. And the Lord said unto Moses, Make make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass that every one that is bitten of those natural serpents, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass, and he put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if the serpent had bitten any man, uh, when, when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. What is that serpent of brass about? Well, first of all, that serpent of brass had to be put, upo- be, be put upon a pole. What kind of pole was it? It was a wooden pole. Where did the wooden pole come from? It came from a tree. Amen. So God is teaching them a valuable lesson. What's that serpent all about? That serpent represents Satan. It represents sin. There's an, you have an adversary that's going around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He's bringing temptation into your life. He's trying to trip you up every way that he can. But that serpent has to, everything he's trying to do in your life has to die. And you have to die to sin. Can I have a witness on that? And there came a time when that serpent also represented the res, uh, Jesus Christ. Because the Bible said of Jesus, He who knew, knew no sin became our sin. He took our sins upon Himself. I'm telling you, if you've ever heard a powerful statement, that's it. The one who knew no sin became our sin, that we could be set free. Jesus paid it all. He paid the price. Can I have an amen on that? Praise God, Jesus paid the price. So when they would come, uh, after they, uh, because of their sin, because of their rebellion, the Israelites were being bitten by snakes, and, and people were dying, and there was one remedy. You come, and you look upon that brazen serpent at the top of that pole, and, and God said, when you look upon it, you'll live. you got to look to the brazen serpent and realize, that's what God's taken out of my life. God's taken the enemy out of my life, He's taken the enemy out of my head. He's taken the sin that He's brought to me out of my my life. He's taken those old natural desires out of me. They've been crucified right here. They have died right here. And I have been made to live. Come on, amen. There's another tree. Look with me at 2 Kings chapter 6, verses 5 through 7. There's a tree and an axe head. 
In 2 Kings chapter 6, in verse 5, the Bible said, But as one was failing a beam, cutting a beam down, the axe head fell into the water, and he cried and said, Alas, Master, for it is borrowed. And the man of God said, Where fell it? And he showed him the place, and he cut down a stick and cast it in, in thither, and the iron did swim. Therefore he said, Take it up. Up to thee, and he put out his hand and took it up. You know what that ha- what's, what's being said here is that the man who was cutting down a tree borrowed an axe to cut down that tree. The axe flew off the handle. That's where I guess we get the terminology. He flew off the handle in the heat of the battle, in the heat of the moment. The axe head got loose and it fell into the water. That was his cutting edge. You can't, cut tree, you can't cut a tree down with a flat piece of metal. Amen. You can't cut a tree down with something that's dull. You will work yourself to death, have a heart attack, and fall out dead. Try to cut a tree with something that's not, not sharp. Amen. He could have took the stick that was left and beat that tree and beat that tree, and that tree would have never fallen. Why? Because he's lost the cutting edge that at one time was on the end of that stick. You know what that is representative of today? Not only do sinners need the tree, believers need the tree. Because that cutting edge is our ability to do ministry. That cutting edge is our ability to work for the kingdom of God and be successful. It is Because what were they doing? They were building a building for God. They were building a building for God. And I've come to declare to you, we're working on a building today. I'm not talking about the one next to us, but we're working on a spiritual house. We're working on a spiritual building. We're trying to bring people into the kingdom of God, but we need the cutting edge that only the Holy Ghost can give. It's not our cutting edge. We have borrowed it from the hand of God. We have borrowed it from the power of the Holy Ghost. And as long as the Holy Ghost is upon us, we have the cutting edge, and we can get the job done. But when you lose your cutting edge, you're in trouble. I'm telling you, the power of God makes us successful in ministry. Amen? You want to be... I know know you can build churches or you can build groups of people, large groups of people, and you can do it the man-made way. You 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 can go to the way of entertainment. You can go to the way of preaching philosophy and make it sound real good, and you can bring large crowds together. But you can't get them to heaven. But when you're working with a cutting edge that the Holy Ghost has loaned to you, you see, it's not you doing the work, it's the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit does the work, He's bringing you into the kingdom. He's bringing people into the kingdom through you. And He's building a kingdom that cannot be defeated. We're building a house. We're building a building. But we dare not build it on sand. Because if you build it on sand, it'll be swept away by every wind of doctrine, by by trouble, by famine, by, by all the things that come our way. But when you build a house that God is building, when you help Him build that house, it will not fall. Amen? Come on, give him a hand clap of praise. We need the anointing of God in every single thing that we do for God. i got to hurry. There's another tree I want to talk to you about. And I think this is the last one, but in Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 22, the Bible said that people were sick, they were suffering, they needed a cure. And here's what Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 22 says. Is there no bomb? in Gilead is there no physician there why then is not the health of the daughter of my people recovered what God is saying there he said the bomb of Gilead in Gilead there was a forest and in that forest there were it was full of trees that produced this uh, healing salve, this healing bomb it had to be processed it had to be taken out of the tree 
And once it's taken from the tree and it's processed by the physician, by the person that's been trained to process it, they would begin to apply it and it would bring healing and health to a lot of people. And it, and, and it was wanted the worldwide. Everybody wanted the healing balm of Gilead. But what God has said is, here are my people. They are living inside the forest. They are living inside the place where there's tree after tree after tree that, he ha that has the, the ability to heal them, but nobody's applying the healing balm. There's no physician. They're not going to the physician. What, the, what, what God is saying here is, you're living in the middle. Healing is all around you. Deliverance is all around you. Why aren't you being made whole? Because you won't accept the physician and you won't get a hold of the healing balm and apply it to your life. And that's where the world's at today. There's been enough sermons preached to save the entire world several times over. The healing balm of Gilead is available. It's everywhere. It's plentiful. But the thing is, is you've got to turn to the great physician. And the great physician knows how to apply the healing balm that can heal your life. Amen. Praise God. If I, if I came up today and I told you I, I, uh, I have a, an ointment or I've got a lotion or I've got a potion that's guaranteed to heal any form of cancer. I don't care what it is. It'll heal it all. People would be lined up. I'm telling you, we, people would come from all over the world and they would gather to this little town of Paragul and they'd have their hand out, can I have some of that ointment? Can I have some of that healing? And they'd be willing to pay whatever the price is. But can I tell you that that's, that's the message that's being brought to, before us today is that people are dying without Christ. They are dying lost. But there's a healing bomb. There's trees all around us. But I'm telling you, those trees point to a tree that is, that is greater than all others, and that's the tree, that's the cross of Jesus Christ. Uh, amen. Prophets have been uh, proclaimed that it was coming. Preachers have been pointed back towards it and said it's already happened. There's been enough sermons preached. Uh, amen. The, there's been the, there's, the God's given us plenty of time to, to find that healing salve and to get it applied. Uh, God has given us plenty of time to hear the sermon and to, re and, to, and to respond and to come to the altar and to pray and to receive what He's done for us. Uh, but He said, why? Why aren't there any more healings? Why aren't there any more lives being changed? Because I put you in the middle of a forest that's got healing everywhere, but you've got to turn to the physician, and you've got to receive the salve, and you've got to be made whole. Hallelujah. It's all right. Then Jesus says, this is my closing scripture. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 16, verse 21. The Bible said, From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how he must go unto, go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders, the chief priests, the scribes, and be killed and raised the third day. Jesus was telling them, I'm going to the cross. And I'm going to die on that cross for you. But if you'll look to the, what happens on that tree. Now listen, I hear some folks sometimes preach about the cross, the cross, the cross, the cross, like the cross itself saves. It's not the wood itself, it's what happened on that cross. It's not faith in the piece of wood, it's faith in the man. Amen? So let it be clear that when we talk about the cross, we're talking about what happened on that cross. We're talking about the one who died on that cross. But thank God Jesus died on the cross is not the end of the story. It's not the end of the story. What's the end of it? He rose on the third day. Thank God He rose. Glory to God. They pulled Him off of that, that tree. They pulled Him off of that cross. And they put Him in a borrowed tomb. And in three days He came back to life. And He said, because I live, you shall live also. Hallelujah. 
Jesus came off that Jesus came out of that tomb not to leave you bound, not to leave you in chains of despair, not to leave you in chains of addiction, not to leave you in bondage to sin. He came, he died on that cross and he rose on the third day to point to say to us today, I'm telling you, every chain can be broken, every form of sin can be broken from your life, and you can have victory in your life. He defeated death, he defeated hell. He defeated sin. Amen. And He can defeat sickness and disease as well. Praise God. Would you stand with me? I am grateful today for that tree. The tree that gives life. And make no mistake about it. When God, when the Bible said to, about Moses, and God showed him a tree, the Lord showed him a tree. That tree was pointing forward. Thousands of years into the future, a couple of thousand, or a few hundred years into the future to, the, to what was going to happen at Calvary. Saying, throw that tree in the midst of your situation and watch it change. I don't care where you are today. If you're worried about where you're going to spend eternity, come to the tree. Throw the message of Christ crucified and resurrected into the middle of your situation. And the bitter waters of your life will be healed. Jesus said, or God said, I am the Lord that healeth thee. Healed by the tree. Praise God. If there's a one here today that's lost, that doesn't know Jesus, I want you to come. I want you to step out of where you are and come to this altar right now. If there's a one today, maybe you're, you've one time had a, good relationship with God, but you know that today you're not where you need to be. I want you to come. If there's somebody to, here today and, and you've tried religion, you tried Jesus plus something else, Jesus in a mixture of works or Jesus in a mixture of other things, and you found that it wasn't sufficient, then come and try Jesus alone. Because nothing what can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Friends, that's biblical. Hallelujah. Thank God for all these that are coming. It's not too late for you. If you have a need, I want you to come. We're going to begin to pray with these that have come. If there are others in this room that need to respond, I want you to come. I want you to be made whole today. For the homeless and forsaken, for the hungry and the cold, for the prisoner and the captive.